Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, we're beginning a brand new series entitled The QME's Financial Impact. And this is going to be a fascinating series for you because in this series, we're going to talk about some topics that you've never before heard discussed in any QME continuing education uh, study program or in any seminar. And what we're going to attempt to do in this program is to shed some light on how the opinions and conclusions that each of us render in every single evaluation that we do impact, number one, the examinee's financial condition, and number two, the financial condition of the workers' compensation system as a whole on a statewide level. And uh, I want to begin today's discussion, uh, and I want to begin this series, by sharing with you some statistics from some recent studies uh, that have just been published and have just been uh, distributed, both of which uh, are dated in the 2017 as data uh, is just now coming in for end of 2017 uh, year-end tallies. So the first uh, study that I wanna share with you comes from the Workers' Compensation Insurance Rating Bureau of California, also known as the WCIRB. And this is a 2017 study. And then also, uh, also published uh, in mid-2017 is a study by the RAND Corporation dealing with provider fraud in workers' compensation. And I have extracted from that large report uh, a smaller sub-report, uh, chapter four within that report, entitled uh, bringing post-employment claims back into the system. We're going to talk about post-employment claims and cumulative trauma claims, both of which are uh, a certain type of claim that qualified medical evaluators are seemingly inundated with throughout the state of California, especially in Southern California. So I want to share with you some statistics from these two studies and show you how the opinions and conclusions that you render related to the difficult and big money issues in your evaluation, including your opinion on causation, including your opinion on permanent impairment, including your opinion on apportionment. I want to show you how your opinions on those big money issue topics impact, number one, the examinee, and number two, how those opinions impact the workers' compensation system as a whole on a statewide level throughout the state of California. And uh, it's gonna be a fascinating discussion. In addition to those topics, in other words, statistics first, causation discussion section, second, permanent uh, impairment discussion third, apportionment discussion fourth, we're gonna conclude this series with a fascinating discussion on the QME and the QME's financial concerns and we're going to talk about how the QME gets paid for his evaluations. And even more interestingly, we're going to talk about how the QME's compensation for his evaluation impacts and incentivizes <laughs> his opinions on the big money issues, causation, permanent impairment, and apportionment. And this is going to include some frank discussion uh, that you cannot and will not find anywhere else. I can guarantee you that. So I have a fascinating program for you uh, here today. And for today's discussion, it's going to be helpful for you to be able to have your eyeballs uh, on these two studies uh, that we're going to be referencing today. So I've included a download link for these studies in today's blog. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and assemble these two studies and uh, get them spread out in front of the table in front of you so that we can speak uh, intelligently about uh, some statistics upon which uh, a large portion of this series is going to be based. So I'll give you a minute to go ahead and assemble those materials and I look forward to being back here with you uh, in just a couple moments as we begin today our brand new series entitled The QME's Financial Impact. So I look forward to being back with you here in just a very few moments. OK, 
Okay, I'm back with you now, and today we're beginning a new series entitled The QME's Financial Impact. And in order to set the tone for today's discussion, I want you to think about the last three or five evaluations uh, that you performed. And when you think about the opinions and conclusions that you offered in those reports, those opinions and conclusions impact the parties, meaning the examinee, meaning the claims administrator, also known as the employer. It, those opinions and conclusions impact any applicant attorney that may be involved in the case. Those opinions and conclusions impact any defense attorney that may be involved in the case. And in a larger sense, and the broader picture is, that those opinions and conclusions that you offer impact the workers' compensation system as a whole on a statewide level. So your opinions and conclusions that you offer as a qualified medical evaluator impacts the system financially. And that's the title of this discussion, the QME's financial impact. So what we wanna do is we wanna step back from the minutia and the up close and personal aspect of the qualified medical evaluation and step back and take a look at the big picture of how our opinions and conclusions on a broad scale impact the workers compensation system as a whole. And so I wanna begin by sharing with you some statistics about the workers compensation system as it exists today in 2018 uh, and share with you some statistics that you've probably never heard. These are some statistics that describe the state of the workers' compensation system throughout the state of California and compare the California system with other workers' compensation systems on a state-by-state -state basis. So this is gonna be a fascinating discussion for you. And then once we have these statistics established, I wanna share with you how your opinions and conclusions on the big three money issues such as causation, permanent impairment and apportionment, how they have the capacity to impact these statistics uh, on a big picture, broad spectrum, statewide uh, level. Okay, so uh, let's begin by uh, reading some statistics. And this comes from a 2017 study just published by the Workers' Compensation Insurance Rating Bureau in California. And this is a group uh, that assembles uh, uh, statistics on an annual basis and publishes those statistics and they are available to you uh, with a simple Google search. That's how I came up uh, with these statistics. Okay, so let's go through some of these statistics uh, very quickly uh, with just a very brief discussion about some of the more relevant statistics as those statistics impact the work that we do as qualified medical evaluators. So with regards to the workers' compensation system in California, the system here involves more than 200 insurance companies. Those 200 insurance companies provide coverage to nearly 700,000 businesses. Those are what we refer to as the employers and delivers medical and wage replacement benefits to almost 800,000 injured workers annually. So, the workers' compensation system delivers two types of benefits, medical treatment benefits, and then uh, wage replacement benefits, also known as indemnity benefits. And we're gonna be referring to the term indemnity uh, more here as we go. So approximately 800,000 injured workers uh, are receiving benefits annually. 800,000, what's 800,000 divided by 12? Is that uh, approximately between 60 and 70,000 claims filed on a monthly basis? Okay, 60 to 70,000 claims filed statewide uh, on a monthly basis. Now, uh, we're going to talk about five different categories that impact the financial status. Uh, of the workers' compensation system in California. We're gonna talk about employer costs, and we'll talk about how the qualified medical evaluator can impact employer costs. 
We're going to talk about the distribution of costs and how the qualified medical evaluator impacts the distribution uh, of costs. We're going to talk about the frequency of claims, claim frequency. It seems that claim frequency uh, differs regionally in California. So for those of you that are involved and in, in, in work, live and work in areas where there's a high claim frequency in the state of California, you need to understand some regional specificity uh, about each of your evaluations that you're uh, evaluating or that you're involved with. We're going to talk about uh, claims duration, how long claims uh, stay open in California and how the opinions and conclusions of the qualified medical evaluator affect or impact claims duration. And then finally, we're going to talk about what are referred to as frictional costs, a sort of side effect costs uh, of the system here in California. Okay, so let's begin, first of all, with employer costs. Now, Many times when I speak to qualified medical evaluators on the telephone or in person, qualified medical evaluators tell me that they have no concern whatsoever for the uh, employer or for the claims administrator and for the costs that are borne by the employer and the claims administrator. But let me just remind each of you that probably you are an employer yourself. And I don't know if you've had uh, any of your uh, employees file a workers' compensation claim for an injury under your employment, but it bears remembering that each of us are employers. And it's always uh, a bit of an upset when an employee files a claim for workers' compensation benefits. So it's important to bear in mind uh, your nature as an employer as you render your opinions and conclusions. Now in the workers' compensation system in California, we have a system that's weighted for the protection of the employee. It's called the liberal, liberal construction philosophy. And the liberal construction philosophy is that opinions and conclusions and decisions of the courts are to be construed, are to be liberally construed for the protection of those injured uh, while on the job in California. So the system is skewed to liberally construe benefits and uh, decisions in favor of the injured worker. But it also bears in mind uh, remembering that each of us are employers and that employers need to be treated fairly as well and that employers have costs for workers' compensation insurance that continue to escalate in the state of California. And if you were around in 2004 and 2005 when Senate Bill 899 came out, you remember that the whole purpose of Senate Bill 899 was to provide relief to employers who were being inundated and overwhelmed with continued, continuing escalation of workers' compensation costs. So as qualified medical evaluators, we have some impact over those costs. So let's talk about some of the employer costs in California. Number one, California continues to have the highest rates, the highest workers' compensation premium rates in the country, the highest, number one. And this is due largely to, number one, the high frequency of permanent disability claims, number two, the high medical cost per claim, three, a more prolonged pattern of medical treatments, and number four, a much higher than average cost of handling claims and delivering benefits. So let's think about this. We have in California a high frequency of our claims go on to suffer permanent disability. Do you as a qualified medical evaluator have any impact over the permanent disability rating or the permanent disability determination of the examinee? Of course you do you have a direct impact over employer cost with your decision making on the permanent impairment determination. Let me ask you, if these high rate premium rates are in part due to a more prolonged pattern of medical treatments, do you as a qualified medical evaluator provide opinions that impact the duration that medical treatments are rendered for the examinee? Of course you do. 
Many times we see examinees and we opine that their condition is not permanent and stationary and that they require more medical treatment. Well, is it possible that those are examinees who will not respond to medical treatment and are simply being provided medical treatment unnecessarily for whom they will not recover to a pre-injury condition and will go on despite medical treatment to, to receive a permanent disability rating? Of course they do. <laughs> so this is an area where your opinions and conclusions as a qualified medical evaluator have a direct impact on the system statewide. Now, in terms of uh, employer costs, uh, it seems that there's an unequal distribution of costs. 35% of all indemnity claims in California arise from the Los Angeles region, but only 29% of the statewide premiums collected for workers' compensation benefits arise from the Los Angeles region. So there's a disproportion, at least in Los Angeles, between the costs of delivering benefits and the income derived from premiums for those benefits. Well, that disproportion is offset by other parts of the state. For example, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, Sonoma, and Napa regions has a much lower share of indemnity claims than the uh, pure premium dollars that they collect uh, overall. And so there's this seemingly disproportion in the Los Angeles area with a high frequency of claims statewide emanating from the Los Angeles area. This is important to know if you're a Los Angeles Basin based qualified medical evaluator. And we'll talk more about uh, how Los Angeles seems to uh, impact uh, the system as a whole here as we go. So what about cost distributions? In the rendering of benefits to injured workers, there are two types of costs. There's medical benefit costs and there are indemnity costs, indemnity costs such as wage uh, protection costs, protection against loss of income in the form of temporary disability and permanent disability costs. Well, temporary disability and permanent partial disability, permanent partial disability, which is anything less than 100% disability, comprise over 90% of indemnity benefits. Other benefits include permanent total disability, death benefits, and what are simply referred to as other benefits. With total temporary disability benefits approximately $1.6 billion per year and permanent disability benefits approximately $1.4 billion per year. It seems that temporary disability benefits outweigh permanent disability benefits. And let me ask you, as a qualified medical evaluator, do you opine for periods of temporary disability? Of course you do. Do you opine for permanent partial disability? Of course you do. Those two indemnity benefits, TD and PD, comprise over 90% of all indemnity benefits paid. It's the death benefits that are small. It's the total permanent total disability benefits are small. It's the TD number one and the permanent partial disability number two that make up the bulk of the indemnity payments. As far as medical payments, it seems that payments for physician services are down. Physician services are down. In other words, treatment costs are down. What's up are payments that are made directly to injured workers which are primarily for future medical care services, those have increased due largely to the acceleration in claims settlement rates. This is fascinating. These are the cases that settle by way of compromise and release for which the qualified medical evaluator has provided an opinion on future medical care. It seems that more and more claims are settling quicker and the future medical care benefits are being bought out 
are being bought out by the claims administrator and paid out to the examinee in the form of a direct payment. And it seems that uh, this is a trend uh, that's increasing on a statewide basis. So as a qualified medical evaluator, do you opine for future medical care? Of course you do. Your opinion on future medical care has a tremendous impact uh, on the system statewide. And it seems that your opinion on future medical care is being used more and more, not for the purpose of receiving future medical care into the future, but rather for the purposes of a lump sum settlement payment made directly to the examinee. So it bears caution uh, how it is that you opine on future medical care when you know that in the, in the case of more and more examinees, more and more examinees are opting and electing to take a buyout for the future medical care opinion rather than use the future medical care opinion as its intended purpose <laughs> for care on into the future to cure and relieve from the effects of the industrial injury. Okay? Isn't this fascinating? All these statistics, all these statistics directly relate to the work that we do and to the opinions and conclusions that we render as qualified medical evaluators. Well, imagine this. In terms of cost distribution under medical costs, it seems that the costs of medical legal evaluations that we do uh, have increased. Uh, it seems that the cost of QME evaluations is roughly one third of a billion dollars annually. That's $333 million annually paid for qualified medical evaluations. And I can tell you that this is one area where the Division of Workers' Compensation is, is taking a direct look at and uh, attempting to uh, scale back the amount of dollars uh, dedicated and paid out annually to qualified medical evaluators for the ev their evaluations. $0.33 billion for QME evaluations on a statewide basis annually, okay? Let's talk about claim frequency, how often claims are filed per 1,000 employed lives uh, in California. It seems that uh, claim frequency in the Los Angeles Basin continued to increase in 2012, 2013, and 2014, while frequency in other regions of California and in most other states returned to a modest year-to-year -year decline. So while the number and frequency of claims in parts of California outside of Los Angeles uh, have a modest year-to-year -year decline, it seems that the rates of claims in the Los Angeles basis uh, are disproportionately increasing, increasing. So it seems that there's a small microcosm in the Los Angeles area that makes that region of the state and that region of the country uh, unique in that claim frequency continues to escalate, whereas in surrounding areas in the state of California and in the country in general as a whole, there seems to be a modest year-to-year -year decline. In fact, the frequency in the Los Angeles and Long Beach area is 24% higher than the statewide average, while the frequency of claims in the peninsula and Silicon Valley is 26% lower than the statewide average. So Los Angeles is 25% higher than the state average, and the Bay Area is 25% lower than the state average. Now, this is fascinating, and this relates directly to the work that we do as qualified medical evaluators. Almost one-fifth of indemnity claims in 2015 involve CT injury, and I bet that statistic is even higher in 2016 and even in 2017 when it seems there was an explosion of CT claims. But this study, this uh, 2017 study from the WCI, WCIRB, 
the most recent statistics upon which they rely or the most recent statistics that they've been able to accumulate uh, is only as uh, current as 2015. But anyway, uh, almost one-fifth, that's 20%, involved CT injury, and this is more than doubled since 2007. Makes you wonder, why is that? Why is the number of CT claims doubling? Uh, research has shown that for cumulative trauma injury claims, and I know you'll find this to be true, most involve multiple body parts, most are filed in Southern California, most involve representation of an injured worker by an attorney, most are filed following the termination of the employee. This is the so-called post-employment or post-termination claim. And we defer to the term post-employment rather than the term post-termination because the term post-employment confers that the employment terminated uh, for reasons uh, unrelated to either the employee or reasons unrelated <coughs> to the employer. Typically, we think of a post-termination claim <coughs> as the employment ending being initiated by the employer, such as a layoff or such as a firing, whereas the term post-employment uh, doesn't put the blame on either of the parties for the termination of the employment. It simply confers that the employment ended and that the claim was filed at some point after the employment period uh, ended, okay? So many are filed post-employment. So as qualified medical evaluators, we see these types of claims all the time. The post-employment cumulative trauma claim with attorney representation. These are especially prevalent in Southern California, but of course they're making their way into Northern California as well and probably represent every other case that you're evaluating uh, here now in 2018. Most are initially denied either in part or in whole, and we'll talk about how the claims administrator's denial of these claims uh, creates a, an entire system of fraud uh, and how you can spot these types of cases in your very next evaluation. And we'll get into that when we go into the RAND study which dedicates an entire chapter to these post-employment claims. It's entitled, Bringing Post-Employment Claims Back Into the System. So we'll talk about those and we'll talk about how to handle those. Uh, cumulative trauma injury claims are filed much more frequently in the Los Angeles, Long Beach area than in other regions in California, and they're filed very infrequently in the rural areas of California. Uh, California indemnity claim frequency is more than two thirds higher than the countrywide mean. So California uh, is leading the pack in cumulative trauma claims. California has by far the highest permanent partial disability claim frequency in the country. And we've talked about this before, it seems that for some reason, qualified medical evaluators find permanent impairment in every single examinee. <laughs> it seems that every single examinee fails to recover to pre-injury condition and therefore qualifies for a permanent impairment rating from the qualified medical evaluator. Well, it's no surprise then that California has by far, by far, the highest permanent partial disability claim frequency in the country. And I wanna, I wanna ask you as you look at your very next examinee, ask yourself, is it possible that this examinee has recovered to pre-injury condition? Is it possible that this examinee does not qualify for permanent impairment? Is it possible that this examinee is good? That this examinee has responded to time, has responded to medical treatment? that this examinee has gotten well. People do get well with time and treatment, correct? But it seems in California workers' compensation, we're not happy, we're not comfortable unless we're providing a permanent impairment rating for every single examinee. And I want you to ask yourself how your opinions and conclusions impact 
the system on a statewide level. Well, here it is. California has the highest permanent partial disability claim by far in the country. Okay? So we're going to talk about this more when we get to our discussion on permanent impairment. Permanent disability claim frequency is significantly higher in the Los Angeles Basin area than in the rest of the state. Okay? Let's talk about, so, so just to summarize that, that's a discussion about claims frequency, claims frequency, and the qualified medical evaluator has a direct impact on some of these numbers. What about claims duration? In other words, the length of time from reporting of the claim to the permanent and stationary declaration and the conclusion of the claim, that's referred to as the claim duration. California has by far the longest duration of medical payments of all states. Okay? And this is largely driven by four things. Number one, the duration of time it takes to report claims. And in California, it seems that we can have claims reported days, weeks, months, years, and even decades, even decades after the actual incident of injury. So California has the longest duration of claims reporting. Number two, the length of time that claims stay open. It seems that qualified medical evaluators have a difficult time concluding cases. So start concluding some cases, would you? <laughs> Don't be bashful about concluding cases and putting a completed stamp on your very next evaluation if that appears to be appropriate. Number three, a high proportion of permanent disability and cumulative injury claims. And we talked about that. And then number four, high rates of litigation. It seems that when there is attorney representation involved, claims become exponentially more complex and stay open uh, exponentially longer than claims that are devoid of attorney representation. Regarding claims duration, California has the slowest pattern of indemnity claim reporting at 12 months with the proportion of claims unreported at 12 months more than twice the comparison state median. So it seems in California claims, the number of claims that are filed at 12 months after the date of injury California has the highest number of those. In other states, the majority of claims are reported before 12 months. But in California, claims can be reported months, years, even decades after the date of injury. And California leads the nation in the numbers of claims reported at times greatly removed from the date of injury. A large proportion of the late reported claims in California, of course, involve these cumulative trauma injuries, many of which are filed following the employee's termination. So you need to be acutely sensitive to these post-employment cumulative trauma claims. And according to the RAND study, the post-employment cumulative trauma claims are largely, largely, not completely, but largely, uh, a fraud scheme, and we'll talk about how that scheme plays out uh, when we get to our discussion of the RAND study. California has the highest proportion of indemnity claims open at 60 months, that's five years, at more than three times the comparison state median. So you would think that five years after the date of injury, most claims should be closed at five years following the date of injury, correct? I mean, you can have a heart attack and be at MMI in what period of time? A year? You can have a stroke and be back at MMI in what period of time? A year? Two years? What, at MMI? California has 
The highest proportion of claims open at 60 months, 60 months, that's five years, at more than three times the comparison state median, meaning compared to uh, several other states, I think it was 10 states that they used as comparison states. Now, this slower rate of claim closure in California is in part attributable to the high volume of medical liens, and we'll talk about liens as relates to uh, fraud when we get to the RAND study. Number two, the higher rates of permanent disability and cumulative trauma injury claim frequency, which seems to make these claims go on and on and on forever and ever. And then number three is a high complexity of handling and settling claims resulting in frequent attorney involvement and attorney disputes. So it seems that uh, attorney representation uh, has a dramatic impact on uh, most aspects of costs associated with the workers' compensation system. And speaking of attorney representation, attorney representation uh, makes up a large proportion uh, of what are referred to as the frictional costs. Frictional costs uh, are uh, associated costs and the, uh, these are largely related to attorney representation. It seems that the rates of legal representation in Southern California are significantly higher than in Northern California. So if you're a Southern California QME, you need to be aware of these region specific trends in your area. The rates of legal representation have been increasing steadily since 2000, the year 2000, in both Northern and Southern California, with legal representation rates in California higher than for most other states. Why would that be? Why would the rates of legal representation be higher in California, and specifically higher in the Los Angeles Basin than in other parts of California and then and, and than in other states throughout the country. Why would that be? Well, we can only speculate as to that, but I have some ideas to share with you and some opinions on that, and I'll discuss that with you uh, when we get to uh, the RAND study. So in summary, it seems that California rates remain the highest in the country and California permanent disability claim frequency is the highest in the country. So many of these costs system-wide can be directly related to the qualified medical evaluator's opinions and conclusions. So as a qualified medical evaluator, you have a direct impact on the fiscal, <coughs> excuse me, on the fiscal condition of the workers' compensation system <coughs> in the whole state of California. Your opinions and conclusions on the big money issues, which are causation, AOE, COE, permanent impairment, and apportionment uh, of the permanent impairment, play a critical uh, role in the overall health of the system. And therefore, it's important that your opinions and conclusions on these uh, big three money issues be <coughs> accurate, that they be truthful, that they be spot on, that they be a true representation of the examinee's actual condition so that uh, so that the system uh, can continue to function uh, in comparison to the way uh, it functions compared to other states uh, and, and specifically so that the uh, system in Los Angeles can be brought into more proper alignment with the function of the system in other parts of California which seem to be a little bit more uh, balanced in comparison to what they refer to as comparison state averages. So I want to talk to you uh, in our next session about how your opinion and determination and your, your conclusion on the causation determination directly impacts uh, some of these costs throughout the state of California. So I have a fascinating discussion, a series of discussions coming up for you over our next several sessions. 
And uh, in this order, we're going to go over uh, in our next session the causation determination. And I'm going to tell you how to never, ever, ever make another mistake uh, on your AOE, COE determination throughout the uh, remainder of your career. I'm going to show you a system that will help you opine correctly 99.99% of the time on the AOE, COE determination. After that, we're going to talk about uh, your permanent impairment determination. And we're going to talk about how permanent impairment determinations in the state of California are way, way, way overinflated and how your permanent impairment determination uh, is not accurate and is not based upon the AMA guides and is not based on physical, true objective physical examination findings. And I'm going to show you how to prepare permanent impairment ratings that indeed are a true representation of the examinee's true condition as they present to you in the face-to-face -face evaluation. And then we're going to talk about your apportionment determination. And in California, it seems that the percentage of permanent impairment directly related to the industrial injury is way, way, way overinflated. And the percentage of permanent impairment due to other factors is way, way, way un understated. So we have overinflated and understated. And I'm going to show you how to bring your apportionment determination uh, into uh, more accurate alignment with the facts and with uh, the true situation as it presents to you. And then finally, in our last session, we're going to talk about uh, payment for QME services and how payment for QME services incentivizes the opinions and conclusions of the qualified medical evaluation. And you know, we typically think of qualified medical evaluations as supposing to, supposing to be uh, objective, neutral, and unbiased determinations, when in fact the opinions and the conclusions of the qualified medical evaluator are strongly influenced and strongly incentivized by the method with which the qualified medical evaluator can bill for his report and based upon the uh, payment for the qualified medical evaluator's report. And I'm sure you're going to find this to be a fascinating discussion. So I have a great program coming up for you and I uh, look forward to being with you on our very next session. For now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'm wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.